If there's one thing we love about Doctor Who, and let's be real, there's a lot of things we love about Doctor Who, is that we love the zany wackiness of it all. Even if sometimes we're so confused. And that's something that we're going to look at today. Those moments that left us thoroughly scratching our heads. They might have not taken us out of the episode or made us enjoy it any less. But certainly once the dust settles and we sit back, we go, wait a minute. What? I'm Sean Ferry for Who Culture, and here are 10 Doctor Who moments that make no sense. Number 10. Graham randomly shows up in a volcano. Despite an extended runtime, the power of the Doctor was bursting at the seams. It had a lot to cram in, including a cameo from everyone's favourite game show hosting companion. Bradley Walsh returned to the fray as Graham, leading a support group for ex-companions at the episode's end. Before this, he saved the day by helping Ace defeat the Daleks, who were trying to set off numerous volcanoes all at once. I told you it was a busy episode. But hang on just a jiffy. How the hell did Graham get there? How does he just show up inside a volcano? Last we checked, there are no public footpaths into the centre of boiling hot pits of doom, even if one simply can walk into Mordor. Uh, sorry. And Graham hardly has the resources or the athleticism of a James Bond super spy. And how did he even know which volcano to visit? It won't shock you to learn that there were quite a few of them dotted around the earth. It's one of those things that you're just meant to accept, but it still keeps me awake at night thinking about it. Number nine, destroying the Cybermen with love. Before he inexplicably became one of the most hated men on Earth, James Corden made two appearances in Doctor Who as the lovable lad Craig Owens. In The Lodger, the 11th Doctor helps Craig come to terms with his love for his best friend Sophie. When he pays him a second visit in closing time, Craig and Sophie have a baby called Alfie, or Stormageddon, Dark Lord of All to his mates. The Doctor, Craig and Stormzy discover that a group of Cybermen are hiding in a nearby shopping centre because even robots can't resist a bargain. They end up capturing Craig and begin converting him when he hears Alfie's cries. They wouldn't, would they? Oh yeah. Yes, they would. Craig uses the power of love to overcome the conversion, saving himself and eventually leading to the Cyberman's destruction. Really, the power of love? Okay. It might be the most cliched hackneyed ending imaginable. What are they going to do next week? The Doctor fakes his own death. <laughs> we probably should have seen this coming. Considering that love saves the day was also the solution in the lodger. But doing this to the Cyberman was a little bit criminal. Number eight, they throw rocks now. Blink is one of those episodes that will always have a place in the hearts of Whovians, which makes it all the more difficult to accept that there's really weird detail right at the start of it. Sally Sparrow first gets a sense that her life is about to make a strange turn when she reads a message scrawled on the wall of Wester Drumlin's Duck Now. Moments later, a rock flies in through the window, narrowly avoiding her head. According to writer Stephen Moffat, a nearby weeping angel threw the rock so that it could make Sally an easier target, which was perhaps the first clue that he was a bit confused by his own monster. We've never seen another angel attempt anything like this. So what made this one such a wimp? Angels move at lightning speeds, even the weaker ones in Blink, as we see at the end of the episode. So why do they need to incapacitate their victims? Surely that's the whole point of their ability. Sorry, Stevie boy, but you're not off the hook with this one. Number seven, Legend of the Sea Devils. Just generally. Ah, Legend of the Sea Devils. What a beautiful, beautiful mess. Jodie Whittaker's second to last outing as the Doctor is not only the least watched New Who episode ever, but it was also roundly smashed by fans and critics. The production of the episode was extremely rushed, something even showrunner Chris Chibnall has admitted to, and oh boy you can tell. At one point the TARDIS, with the Doctor and Yaz on board, gets eaten by a giant sea monster. A few minutes pass and we spend some time with Pirate Dan, and when we cut back to the Doctor and Yaz, they're somehow inside the sea devil's base. What? It's not clear where they are or how they got there. Is the sea devil base inside the monster? Or has it transported them somewhere else? And where's the monster now? There are so many small disconnects like this one throughout the episode and it makes the whole thing rather confusing and a bit frustrating really to watch. Number six, Captain Jack goes hand hunting. In David Tennant's first proper outing as the 10th Doctor, he engages in a sword fight with the Sycorax leader, which cost him one of his hands. Thankfully, he's able to grow a new fighting hand in its place, which is rather good at throwing Satsumas. The severed limb would serve as a critical plot point later down the line, as Ten is able to use it to stave off regeneration, leading to the creation of the Metacrisis Doctor. Before that, however, he's reunited with his lost appendage, thanks to Captain Jack Harkness, who gives it to him in the Season 3 finale. Question is, how the hell did Jack get it? Sure, Jack works for Torchwood, and can use some wizzy wazzy super duper doctor detector, but he still would have needed to track it down very quickly after it was lost in order to preserve it so well. The bigger sticking point is the fact that the hand fell over London, uh, directly into the EastEnders title sequence, by the looks of it, while Jack is based in Cardiff, a good 150 miles away. Number five, the Doctor's cue cards. 
Under the Lake is the first part of the two-parter from season 9 in which the 12th Doctor and Clara have to deal with a bunch of murderous ghosts aboard an underwater mining facility. It's all very interesting and spooky and science fiction-y, but none of that is why it's on our list. The reason is something far more simple. When the Doctor confronts the crew of the facility early in the story and realises he's been a tad insensitive by expressing amazement that their dead friend coming back as a ghost, Clara reminds him of the cards in his pocket, a selection of stock phrases to help him deal with various situations. This gets a cheap laugh when the Doctor reads out the pain fully generic statement written on one card, but everything else about this moment is really rather flawed. The Doctor might be an alien, but he's not an idiot. He's dealt with plenty of complicated emotional matters without needing a script, so what makes this one so different? It's also difficult to believe that the Doctor and Clara sat down one night for some arts and crafts to put these cards together. You'll note I said difficult to believe, not impossible to believe. Frankly, I think the Doctor would have used a lot of stickers. Clearly the writers liked the gag, but didn't really put an awful lot of thought into whether or not it made sense. Number four, slowest walk ever. Shooty got what kicked off his tenure in the 2023 Christmas special, The Church on Ruby Road, and good grief, was it something else? In a good way. He did a whole musical number for crying out loud. The special also introduced new companion Ruby Sunday and set up her backstory as a foundling abandoned on Christmas Eve. Fifteen ends up travelling back to that day in order to save baby Ruby from becoming goblin food, which is where this odd moment takes place. When the doctor arrives, Ruby's mother is already walking away from the church. He then hot fuzzes the goblin king, rescues Ruby, touches back down on the ground and runs back to the target all of which takes several minutes, and the mother is still in the exact same place she was when he first arrived. Uh, uh, Come on now, there's taking your time, and then there's really taking your time. Is she actually three kids in a trench coat? Was she really wearing heavy shoes? Maybe we'll find out that there were some timey-wimey shenanigans going on here, like the jacketless Matt Smith in Flesh and Stone, or maybe it was done for dramatic effect, so the doctor could stare at her walking away, and walking, and walking, and walking. Either way, it takes you out of the moment, and makes little sense to boot. Number three, why do the Daleks have a spin button? At the end of the season four finale, just when everything looks bleak for the 10th Doctor and his army of friends, human weapons, Donna Noble ascends. The power of the Doctor Donna kicks in, giving her genius intellect and allowing her to set in motion the destruction of the Dalek fleet. She disables their weapons, disarms the reality bomb, sorry, the reality bomb, and makes them do donuts. Okay then, Donna twists a little button on the control desk and makes all of the Daleks spin around, round baby, right, round spin. Then she makes them go the other way because you would, wouldn't you? This is funny and all and cuts through the bleakness of the previous moment, but it raises a whole bunch of questions, chief among them why the Daleks would have a spin function in the first place, not to mention a host of other switches and levers that make them completely useless. Maybe Russell D. Davis wanted to see spinning Daleks, and you know what? That's fair. Number two, quite possibly the worst soldiers in existence. Season 9's The Zygon Invasion, The Zygon Inversion, is remembered for Peter Capaldi's incredible speech at the end of the second episode, and rightly so. However, the rest of the story isn't quite so strong. It's good, don't get us wrong, it's solid. It's just that you'd probably be better off booting up the speech on YouTube rather than sitting through the whole 90 minutes. One highly questionable moment occurs when a group of soldiers approach a Zygon-infested church. Knowing full well that the Zygons are capable of shape-shifting, the soldiers are remembered reminded just before the mission begins that you know what they're capable of, do not fall victim to it. In other words, when the Zygons inevitably take the form of someone you love in order to trick you, ignore it. Guess what happens next? Almost immediately the lead soldier is duped when a Zygon emerges from the church posing as his mother, and despite every single piece of evidence pointing to the fact that they're being lured to their deaths, the entire group of soldiers lower their weapons, enter the church, and are murdered. Well, gee, if only someone had warned them. It's utterly ridiculous that a trained group of soldiers would fall for such a simple ruse. Without a doubt, one of the most contrived moments in recent Doctor Who history. Number one, bye bye Boatswain. Remember him from season six as the curse of the black spot? You probably don't, and there's a very good reason for it. The 11th Doctor and the Pons end up on a pirate ship where the crew are being hunted by a siren, which comes for anyone who sustains even the slightest of injuries. Heading up the Buccaneers is Captain Henry Avery, played by Hugh Bonneville. His fellow sea dogs include a character known simply as the Boatswain, portrayed by Lee Ross. This guy is just sort of there to begin with, until he gets wounded about halfway through, and then he just vanishes to thin air. If you think we're exaggerating, we're not. The Boatswain literally disappears from the story and only emerges at the very end, reunited with his crew. It's never explained what happened to him or, or where he went. Apparently, there was this whole subplot filmed about this character that was cut during editing, creating a significant continuity error in the final episode. Shall we start taking bets on Big Finish plugging the gap with a series of audio adventures? The Boatswain Adventures. Fly off the shelves.
that's everything for our list today, folks. Thank you so much for watching along. Thanks so much to Jacob Simmons, who wrote the original article upon which this video is based. You can check that out over on whatculture.com. I have been Sean Ferrick. You can follow us at Who Culture on the various socials, and you can get me at Sean Ferrick as well. You're awesome. You're wonderful. Keep things wibbly-wobbly. And remember, you deserve love. So treat yourself well.